Hello. Hello, everybody. <laughs> All right, I think we're live. I'm gonna see who has come into chat in the last few minutes. Let me know once you can hear me and everything. Let's see. We have a lot of people here already. <laughs> Hello, hello. Oops, I have to mute myself in the background. <laughs> I, my iPad sound was up on a... Uh, hey, Fast Squatch and Cassie, Donna, Victorian Studio, Shaz, Jess, Canada, Karen. That's a cute name. Uh, Catherine Brown, Luxby, Luxby. Sorry, I, maybe correct me if I say that wrong. Tracy, Hitomi, Rebecca, Cookie, Light Soul, Simone. Oh my goodness, Katharina, or Katarina, Madge, KBB, hello everybody. <laughs> Welcome to my new stream setup. Not that you know any different, but this setup, I, I spent most of today moving my entire room around, reorganizing everything. <laughs> I was like, it was like 10 or 12, eight, t between 10 and 12. I got, I got the itch. I was like, hmm, my desk would be much better on the opposite side of the room. And one thing led to another and it was a disaster zone in here till about two hours ago. <laughs> um, but we are all good now. Everything is set up. Uh, the lighting is good. The camera, I'm using a different camera this time, which is hopefully a little crisper. Um, yeah, I think we're good to go. And also, I've got a <laughs> I've got a sticky note to keep me on track because I want to get through a lot today. <laughs> Hello, Michelle and Tom, Daniela, Rocky, Marissa, Rebecca. Hello, everybody. Oh, Colorado weather. My friend in Colorado sent me a photo of the changing the aspen leaves changing and oh my goodness it is so gorgeous i miss that so much we get changing leaves here and it's beautiful as well but oh, there's nothing nothing compares to going up into the mountains in autumn in colorado and walking among just hills of gold vibrant gold against bright blue almost deep blue sky blue sky Oh, the two, the color combination is incredible. All right. So hello, Jackie and Miranda, Sandra. Hopefully I said hi to everybody. I'm sure more people will filter in. But today we are going to be swatching a lot of gouache. I have my yellows ready to go, but I have my greens purples, pinks, and reds. I have out of the screen, you can't see it, but I have all my blues, turquoises, and then my browns and era uh, metallics. So we have a lot to get through, but I've pre-made all my little swatch cards. I do things a little different now when I swatch. This is a opacity test line, so I'll do the thickest part of the gouache on that line to see how transparent it is. And then I dilute it a little bit, just kind of fade it off the bottom. And then on the same area, I mix that color with white, and then I also mix it with black. So I get a quick reference of what it looks like when it's, um, you know, how opaque it is, what it looks like when it's a little bit diluted, what it looks like when it's got white in it, and then black, because that is often something I'll do while I'm painting. And then we'll do a few different mixing cards using limited palettes. So think about what colors, like as I'm swatching, think about what colors you think I should use for those limited palettes and I'll ask you guys later. And then towards the end, I'll start some light fast test strips. So I'll just show you how I make those. Maybe we'll get through a few of those before the end of the stream. Um, also, please let me know if my mic is too loud or too quiet. It's really close to me, so I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> I hope it's not too loud. I can always shift it. Usually my mic is too soft, so I always have to like adjust it up. 
but now my desk is like right next to the mic so it's easier to control um hello sketches and scrubs <laughs> How's the weather down by you? I heard there might be another storm down south, but then again, that's southern Scotland, so you're you're even southern souther than that. <laughs> you're souther than that. Oh god, it's gonna be a good stream. Okay, we're gonna start left to right. I think I'm gonna try to stay organized during the stream, so I'll use. I I'm gonna try to organize it too before I swatch the like lighter yellows, clean greenish yellows, all the way down to the earthy yellows. I'm not sure which if these are in the right order because I was looking at them when I opened to see like what tone it is, but we'll we'll see as we go. I'm trying not to be insanely OCD about this <laughs> because it's like, what's the point? You know, I just want to do it to learn from it. And speaking of uh, no, I'm not speaking of because I didn't mention it, but I'm going to be using some of my newer brushes. I might use this one or this one or maybe even a filbert, but I think the flat brushes are just really good for swatching because you can keep things a little bit tidier. <laughs> so I'll probably use those, but I will show you. I've got my full set of brushes that are going to be included in the gouache subscription boxes. I, I had a few missing last time when I showed you guys the boxes. If you want to see those, you can go to my previous unboxing stream. Um, but I found the number four rigger brush I was talking about. It's like a really long skinny, holds a lot of pigment and water, but you can get super, super fine lines with that one. And a few other ones that were downstairs <laughs> at the time. So yeah, these are all the brushes, all 24 brushes really excited about those. The sound is good. Okay, excellent. Started raining. Oh yeah, we've had rain and wind all day. Not as bad as the recent storm though. Actually tomorrow on my Sarah and Scotland page, I'm going to post a vlog from last week or the week before. I can't remember now. I think it was last week when Storm Babbitt came through um, and our friend was in town. So we went out every day and did something different and had crazy weather some of those days and it was still really enjoyable though let's see i'll start with the slightly bigger one half inch i think for the first part of this watch i'm just gonna actually yeah i'll, I'll have i have a little mixing sheet on the right side that you can't see but i'll just put a little dollop of each Lemon yellow is usually my go-to mixing yellow because I just love how clean, how vibrant it is. And yeah, I love it. Love, love, love it. I love the mixes I can get with it. Love the way you teach. So enjoyable. Oh, thank you. I've honestly, t teaching, anybody can learn how to teach, but it has taken me a long time. <laughs> And I'm still trying to improve every t every year I focus on trying different techniques. And the more I do it, the more I learn. That's actually pretty opaque. You can almost barely see through that. Usually lemon yellow is a little bit more transparent. Oh, and also I should mention again that all of these are the Shinhan designer gouache colors, professional designer gouache which will be included, every color you see me swatch today will be included in the gouache subscription boxes. So if you signed up for those, which thank you so much if you did, I saw so many people s commenting and saying that they uh, signed up for them and I'm really, really, really excited. So today you get to see all of the gouache you're gonna have over the course of the months. Um, I'm gonna try to you know, do a couple swatches and then I'll, I'll keep trying to catch up with chat. If you ask me a question and I somehow miss it, I'm not ignoring anybody. I'm not, <laughs> I sometimes just miss things in chat. So please ask again, tag my name or something. I don't have any mods here right now to help. So it's all me. <laughs> that can be a little bit challenging. <laughs> I want to make sure I give myself space. I, I think I can make it a little bit wider. Yeah. 
So now I'm going to do a little diluted version as it comes down here towards the bottom. Not that yellows really show up that diluted, <laughs> but I sometimes use gouache like watercolor, especially in the first couple layers. So it is useful to see on paper. Um, probably I'll do my own, uh, I'll do another version of these swatches in my tone to paper sketchbooks at some point. Uh, and I can maybe scan that and make it a blog post. If you guys are interested, let me know. Yeah, we were, sorry, I'm, okay, I know I've missed some things in chat. <laughs> let me scroll up. Hello, everybody. It's just coming in. Hello to the new chatters. Hello from Germany. Hi, my friend was just here from Germany. Hello from the Netherlands. Oh my God, it's so cool how many people are from all over the world. And we're just hanging out and chat. Internet is amazing. <laughs> uh, when you say lemon yellow, do you mean PY3? Well, let's take a look. PY3, yeah. The lemon yellow is PY3. I guess I should say the pigment numbers for anyone who's interested in that because sometimes th companies will name things a little bit differently. So nice to swatch while I'm painting myself. Yay, I'm so happy. Who else is sketching or painting or swatching something right now? Let me know what you're doing. <laughs> we can be productive together. Okay, so I'm going to mix this with white now, which again, these first yellow swatches may not be as exciting or visible to you guys on the stream, but they're, this kind of thing is really useful for me when I'm quickly glancing at my swatch sheets and trying to get a feel for what the colors do. And the reason I have these all separated in different cards like I'll have a different card like this for each group of colors um, is because it's more portable. So I can, these are, these are just a five size pieces of paper and I can throw those in my bag and take them outside with me, which can be really useful. Um, more likely than not, I wouldn't take the swatches out, but I would take the later when we do the color mixing, those are going to be limited palette mixes. And those are the things I take out with me. Clean in your painting space. Nice. <laughs> and of course, feel free to chat with each other. I'll, I do my best to see, to keep up with chat, but um, I know a lot of people here are familiar with each other from previous chats and previous live streams. By the way, I just mixed it with black. So that's what it looks like with black. So one of my favorite ways to make green is mixing yellow with black because technically black is just a super 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 dark blue at least mm, usually which three colors are coming with the first box they i believe it's lemon yellow ultramarine i want to say carmine but it might be quinacridone red um and white so you get four colors first and then the following, the next box, I believe, is the green box. So you get a couple greens and it progresses from there. Next, we have permanent yellow, which is again PY3. <laughs> oh, I just mixed, I uh, just touched my, oh, I'm already making a mess. You can't see it off camera, but that's super opaque. This one's a little warmer though, but super, super opaque. Now I'm just going to dilute it and drag it down. Stay motivated and pr oh, cat hair. <laughs> I mean, it was bound to happen. <laughs> You can see I'm not trying to be super tidy. I'm not obsessing over making this perfect because when I do that, I kind of miss the point. I also, I feel like you can get so caught up with trying to make your swatches and your mixing cards perfect that it can be 
a tedious job or just make you not want to do it all together. And I have done this exact thing that I'm doing to, on today's stream with every single brand of gouache I own I've, and I've tried over the years when that's a lot of mixing and a lot of gouache. So I just know from experience, I have to be kind of loose and have fun with it and not like beat myself up if I make something too imperfect. So that's what it looks like with white. I think I'm gonna have to clean my water as well between each card, the yellow card. Next we'll do the reds and pinks. And then blues and followed by greens and purples. And then at the end, we'll do the browns and stuff. Um, making green with yellow and black. Yes, you can, any paint really. Just checking if I have any comments. Or the black. Oh, I already have some. Next up, this next swatch is what this color looks like with black. And it looks pretty similar to the previous color. You're baking bread. Ooh, that is, oh gosh. Okay. My older sister makes bread from scratch all the time. And a few other people I know and they make it sound so easy and it looks so easy when they do it. And I am just so overwhelmed when I think about trying that. <laughs> Next is cadmium yellow, which is PY35. It, it also looks like a very uh, warm yellow. It's actually a little bit more transparent, which is interesting because usually cadmium's really opaque. So let's dilute it a little. I'd say this one though, it is more vibrant. I probably should have put it there, <laughs> but oh well, we'll just keep going. And that's what it looks like when it's diluted. And then we'll mix some white into it. Uh, anyway, I want to make bread. I even have a bread maker and it's on top of the cupboard and I'm extremely intimidated by the whole idea. I barely just started baking in general, so <laughs> maybe I'll ease into it. Maybe this winter that'll be like my new obsession. And now we have some of that mixed with white. want to stay for the live but can oh it's okay you know this stream will be available to replay for anyone who missed it or has to leave early here it is with black which looks a little bit more yellowy green When do you choose cadmiums versus not when painting? I really rarely use cadmiums of any kind, except for when I'm doing oil painting, um, sometimes acrylic as well, but I don't really do oil or acrylic anymore. I'm kind of waiting, all of that stuff's in storage and I'm waiting until we move, till I have more space because I found it was just way too hard to do that <laughs> with my current setup, especially in the winter. But it is, they are useful colors and I have gouache all over me already and they have their purpose. And there's definitely artists out there who swear by them and say you have to use them, but do what you want. Okay, this is Permanent Yellow Deep, which is PY74 and PY3. My goal with choosing all the colors that are included in the box, that is super opaque. That's beautiful. That's basically orange. Uh, but my goal with choosing all these colors was to get a variety, but also yellow is like obviously really important for mixing. And so, you know, even though a couple of these look similar, if you run out of one, it's like you have a backup, which is really useful. So. It's not that you have to use all of these yellows in all of your paintings. Of course not. That's kind of 
that would be a little crazy. Usually I use one yellow in a painting, but over the course of the months, you get to try different yellows, see what you like. And at the end you have all the gouache. Uh, this is yellow oak. Oh wait, what am I doing? I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> see, this is why I wrote a, a, a sticky note to remind me. Mix with white and black. Do you find the Shinhan dries without hardening in your palette? You have indigo of this line and shell pink, and they are the most moist in my palette. I just set up my new palette. Should, where is that? I can maybe show you in a minute, but I used a few of the Shinhan colors in there so I can test it out. But so far I have not any issues with it being either too wet or too dry. I would say in fact, all the brands, all the professional brands I use, they all re-wet in a dry palette really beautifully. Um, and they all perform really, really well in that sense. The It's only specific colors. It's not the brand, it's certain colors like cobalt, black, burnt umber, maybe indigo as well. Those types of colors will usually dry more kind of rock hard or crumbly and you have to add more water over time. I even found that in my, when I used to keep my wet palette, like my burnt umber would get so dry so fast and that was airtight. <laughs> so yeah, definitely it's a color thing. Here we have this mixed with white. It's a nice peachy orangey tone. My preferred white is definitely like titanium white or primary white. I want it. I want it to be powerful. Next, we'll mix that with a little black. This is definitely a yellowy, earthy green. Obviously, these are just for quick references. Um, when I do the mixing pages, the, it'll, the variety will become more obvious. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned. Next is yellow ochre, which is PY42. I know, me too. I am going to be... Okay, so this is my idea. I've already kind of done a... Uh, draft or kind of trial version of each tutorial for the boxes for the first four months. And that was just to help myself kind of figure out what I want to do. But for the actual recording of it, I'm kind of tempted to like go to the Isle of Skye or somewhere really beautiful and inspiring and rent an Airbnb and choose it, choose a place that has like nice natural light and a big table and like record it there <laughs> just so I'm ultra, ultra inspired. And it ha you know, I don't know, maybe I could show you a bit of the surroundings as well to inspire you during the tutorial. This is dark. Look at that. Um, but yeah, I thought it would be kind of fun because I've never done anything like that and it would make it feel very professional and we'll see. It would probably mostly just be for myself, <laughs> you know, like those watching the tutorial aren't really caring where I am or they'll, they just want to learn, but it would be good for my mental state of while I'm doing it. <laughs> you don't feel very confident with your yellow mixes. You feel like you're guessing and as an in-depth yellow color chart coming from coming up for me soon. Oh yeah. Do you always swatch them with black? Yeah, usually. Um, I started doing that last year because I realized green, uh, mixing yellow with black gives you such lovely greens. And when I'm outside painting, I often don't bring a green. So I'm mixing my own greens on the go. So yellow and black usually gives you more of an earthy green, but then obviously you can do yellow and blue to give you a more cool bluish green. So it's just like a quick, it's a great thing to know like on the fly how to do. Now this is what it's like with some white. It's a nice sandy tone. Yellow ochre and white is a great beach color. Also burnt umber. I 
I'm using primary black. You'll come carry my bags. <laughs> oh my God, that'd be so great. We'll just have like 20 people in, in the posse joining me on the trip. <laughs> Yes, Delta, this will be available after. It'll be a, a replay. Oops, I almost forgot. Mix it with black. See, see, this is like, Wolfie says I have ADD and I, he s seems to think it's gotten worse over the last couple years. <laughs> and I'm not disagreeing, but, oh wow, that's too much. Let's lighten that a little. I forgot what I was saying, oh, sake. That's what it looks like with black. So it almost leans towards a, towards a brown, still a little greeny. Okay. Yeah, these are gorgeous earthy greens, I agree. And like you could add a hint of white to that as well and it would desaturate it and lighten it, or you can add blue to the, this green and it would kind of shift it more towards a cool or even a bit of red, you know, you can adjust that earthy green to whatever you want. Or like later, we're gonna swatch moss green, which is its own tube. And that's basically, uh, I believe this is actually <laughs> lemon yellow mixed with black inside the tube. So it might be brown and yellow, I'm not sure, but we'll see. Um, so that's like a convenience tube, but you can mix it yourself as well. On location tutorials. Yeah. Well, we'll see. I think f since I already, um, yeah, we'll see. I'm not sure what I'll do for the recording. On one hand, it's nice to record somewhere like that. On the other hand, since I have everything in my studio, like good mics, good setup, good lighting, everything exactly how I, I need it. It's easier in my studio. So we'll see. Oh, so next is Naples yellow and that's PY42 and PW6. So it's basically, is it yellow ochre? Yeah. So this is basically yellow ochre mixed with white already in a tube. So it's a convenience mix, a convenience tube. If you don't want to mix it yourself, just put a put that in your palette. Um, it, uh, it is a slightly different, it seems like a slightly different hue though. Like, so maybe they used more <coughs> of this or I don't know. Cause different pigments have different, can have different hues depending how they make them. Everyone sip water. You'll read the Hobbit to me for good night story. <laughs> You're in. <laughs> <laughs> you have to do the voices though. <laughs> if you're up for that, then heck yeah, let's go. So now we are diluting it slightly. Again, this is such a gorgeous sandy beachy tone. I love that for sand. I used to have Naples yellow in my palette a lot and just kind of, not that I forgot about it, but it's I've been mostly using limited palettes. Oops, I don't need any more of that. I've been mostly using limited palettes for a few years now. So I, I barely ever use my convenience colors, but sometimes it's, if I have more space in my palette, I definitely add things like that. Green, mind blown, <laughs> black and yellow equals green. Do you find gouache more expensive than acrylics? Hmm. I don't know because gouache lasts a really long time. I have some tubes of my, some tubes of gouache that I've had for years. And at the time you buy them and you're like, oh, this is so expensive for this tiny little tube, but it lasts so long. And then with acrylics, I paint big and I paint with a palette knife and I paint really thick. So I go through them a lot. So I feel like over the years I've spent way more on acrylics. I don't know. It's a good, it would be interesting to compare those. And I also started buying uh, golden heavy body acrylic, which is really expensive. And then of course with acrylic, I buy canvases. There's a lot of expense with acrylics. 
Someday I'll have bigger space and I'll be able to get back to painting big on big canvases and spread out and get messy. I really miss that. <laughs> oh, okay. So now we're mixing it with black, Naples yellow and black, and it's gray green, which is actually quite lovely. And it makes sense because there's white in that already. So it's kind of white and black gives you that gray desaturated look. Yeah, golden heavy body is really worth the price because it is so much more opaque and so much brighter. For sure worth it, which I didn't realize for the longest time. <laughs> All right, Miranda, have fun. See you later. All right, we have our first set. Oh my gosh, sorry, I just slurped. I'm drinking iced coffee. <laughs> sake. Okay, actually, before we go, let's write the names of these so I don't forget what order they were in since some of them are a little bit similar. So we have, how am I going to do this? Should I do it on the bottom? Lemon yellow. Perm. I always abbreviate. Cad. Perm yellow deep. <laughs> Perm yell deep. <laughs> yellow okra. Naples yellow. Now we are good. Let's do the reds. Next up, fresh sheet. These can, these can, oh, look at my beautiful new gouache bag. My friend bought this for me when she visited and we were wandering around Edinburgh. I just love it so much. I was staring at it in the shop for ages. Like, should I get it? I already have so many bags. Wolfie would kill me if I buy another bag. Should I get it? No, I shouldn't. Should I? No, I shouldn't. And my friend saw me dying inside <laughs> and I walked away. And that when we left the shop, she pulled it out and was like, here you go. Thanks for do giving us an awesome tour of Scotland. <laughs> I was like, oh, I love you. <laughs> Anyways, let's do, start with quinacridone, then carmine, then alizarin crimson, then primary magenta, then opera. You guys, you're going to go blind when I swatch this one. Just beware. <laughs> opera notoriously intense. Not very light fast, but a heck of a lot of fun. Actually, do you guys, have you ever seen, um, I believe her name is Lisa Frank. Wait, no, Jessica Frank. I know it's Frank. Hold on. Let me look up her first name. Lisa Frank was the, like the trapper keeper designs we had in high school. <laughs> Am I dating myself right now? Okay, hold on. Jessica. Yes, Jess Frank. Okay, Jess Frank. Jess Frank is an amazing artist. She works on so many different collections each year, and her work is featured on a lot of products in the U.S., I believe. Anyway, she uses colors like opera and neon oranges and stuff underneath her acrylics and she says like to buyers because she sells all her all her originals she says like straight up I use this color it might fade and look different in a few years but like it is what it is <laughs> and people still all of her work is always sold out and but it looks so amazing under under it's like underneath most of her acrylic paintings and then it pops out because little peaks of it can show through here and there and it just creates the most beautiful little color vibrations and I, I've always admired that but I've always been too scared because I'm like oh I don't want to use it because it's not super light fast but then I don't I like barely sell originals anyway so if I made art like that or not like hers but like my own style but used kind of these neon colors underneath and then scanned it and pr made prints of it it would be totally fine like then it wouldn't matter at all but I always stop myself 
So this color is hopefully going to inspire me this year to be a little more brave and just go for it. So we're going to start with quinacridone red. And this one is PR254. Um, sorry, let me just see if I missed any questions on open acrylics. I really love open acrylics. Those are so much fun. I have like a limited set of them. Have you looked at Ye Naples Yellow Deep? No, I haven't actually. Oh, hello. Someone's sane. <laughs> I'm glad one of us is sane. Hello. Glad you are enjoying the videos. Yeah, gouache is not for everyone, but it's for some people. And if it is, you know it and you're obsessed. <laughs> it's definitely my thing. I love watercolor as well. Those are my two, two, my two top two favorites. But the more I use gouache, the more it just like suits my way of working really well. And because you can dilute it and use it like watercolor as well as opaquely, like I just, I find it so versatile that it's hard to, hard to go without. But I also go through phases of only using watercolor and just getting obsessed with the fluidity and the bleeds and the flowiness of it. And it's magical. It's just, it's just magical. <laughs> okay, stay on track. This is quinacridone red. Oops, I used a little bit too much water in that swatch. There we go. I'm trying not to go too thick, but also not add any water while I do it. And it is quite uh, opaque. It's like, maybe you can see a hint of the line through it. You'll see probably more when it dries and it's not glaring. <laughs> Lisa Frank, yeah, Trapper Keepers. God, do you remember Trapper Keepers? Do they still make those? And like, you know, you there was always that girl in your grade who had the coolest, newest Trapper Keeper with like the coolest Lisa Frank design. You're like, where did you get that unicorn barfing a rainbow riding on a flying slice of pizza? That's amazing. And it was always sold out everywhere. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna dilute it a little bit. It's kind of a, this is kind of a rosy color, not quite rosy, but a little bit rosy when it's diluted. The carmine is especially. Uh, sorry if this wasn't asked, do you permanently live in Scotland? Where are you from originally? Yes, I permanently live in Scotland and I'm originally from America. Mostly the last like 13 years before I moved here was in Colorado, but I also lived in upstate New York when I was younger. It's weird. I was born in Colorado and then we moved to the East Coast and I lived in upstate New York. And then I moved back to Colorado for school and work. And like when I moved back to Colorado, I randomly needed a doctor and I chose this one that was close to my house. And it turned out to be the hospital I was born at. And I didn't even know that. It was like, what? Small world. And the reason I live in Scotland is because my husband is Scottish. So we had to choose one country <laughs> and I love Scotland. So here we are. You use your portable painters in the video. Do you know where to buy them in Europe without high shipping? You can buy them in Jack's, at Jackson's Art. Um, maybe on Amazon as well. I'm not sure. I think so. Um, but yeah, Jackson's and... I mean, otherwise, if you're in Europe, maybe Googling it, finding a local shop that sells them could work. But speaking of Portable Painter, I just have been talking with them over the last few months and I'm officially a brand ambassador for them, which we'll, I'll have like a video about that at some point or like talk about it more in the future, but it's really exciting. And I mentioned recently uh, this idea I had where next year I want to start teaching live workshops and one of my ideas is to have people just arrive just show up with a camera and a sketchbook and maybe brushes 
but I'll give you a portable painter pre-filled with all my favorite colors and then we'll just start the workshop and it would just be this really fun added thing plus then you know you have all the colors and you don't have to worry about bringing anything or forgetting them and yeah it'll anyway I've been talking to them about that and they're really really excited about it too because I've been using it for years now obsessively <laughs> and they noticed and they like my work and you know like my videos so they're they're totally excited about this partnership it's a very you know kind of easy partnership for us because I already use and love their stuff Ooh, look at that that's with black it's uh, like a deep reddish rosy tone yum any chance the tutorials will become available on their own ver via digital subscription I know yeah so I love that idea but probably not for a, the first while they probably won't be for the first like year because people who are buying the boxes are paying for that that's actually like the majority of what you're paying for with the subscription boxes is the tutorials um and I'm I'm going to continue doing Patreon tutorials like my own tutorials off outside of that as well they'll be different so if you're interested in my tutorials, you can still find them on, on Patreon. But yeah, for now, the, the box subscriptions will be our own thing. <laughs> but I think in the future, I could see it being a digital thing as well, or maybe like buying one or two boxes. And I don't know, well, there's lots of options for us in the future. They still make trapper keepers. Oh my gosh. They require you to use them. <laughs> um, what about using quinacridone rose instead of opera pink? Is it the same? Is it that v vibrant? I can't imagine because the reason opera is so intense is that they add um, like fluorescence in it, I believe, which is why it's not as light fast. That's the only reason they fade. I would be really surprised if another color would be as intense as opera. <laughs> um, okay, next we're doing Carmine, which is PR17. Um, and of course, if I missed anything in chat, just let me know. This one is a little more transparent, but it's one of my favorites for mixing because it's more transparent. <laughs> Um, it, it mixes such vibrant, insanely vibrant colors. So usually I use lemon yellow, carmine, um, various blues, but the, the lemon yellow is that pure, bright, clean yellow, and so is carmine in terms of red. So they are really, really powerful mixers. Um, if you use a more opaque color, or a cadmium or something, usually you can't get quite as intense mixes or as wide on the spectrum of mixing. Um, so it's like a thing you kind of have to balance. I'll do a second swatch on the left so we see kind of the, the variety you can get there. And then we'll dilute it a little. And this one is definitely more pinkish. Like it looks rosy when you dilute it or add white, which we'll see in a second. It's really nice. Please do a workshop in the US. Plenty of notice to fly to Scotland. Yeah, so my workshops in Scotland wouldn't start until probably May. And we're currently in the works. We're looking for places as backup venues in case it rains, because it's a thing in Scotland. Obviously, you have to have a backup. And once I have those I can book dates and then like as soon as I know anything, I'll start sharing it online because I get so many requests. And then in terms of going to the US, I would love to do that, but I'm currently waiting for my visa to my my permanent UK visa to come through and I can't move I can't travel or do anything until that's finalized. <laughs> and so that was I applied for that in September and it, they said it could take up to 6 months. So 
not sure. If I do any U.S. stuff, it will be like later in the year, probably. Um, my family lives in the U.S. and a lot of friends still live there, so I'd love to visit again. And most likely it would be either New York or Washington, possibly Colorado, but my family lives in New York and Washington, so yeah, <laughs> it's kind of like I'll definitely need to visit them if I go. Look at that beautiful rosy pink. Love it. Perfect red for fall maple leaves. Mmm. When you fill your portable painters, where do you find the little pans? Those are custom new. They're the new custom pans. They make them. You can buy those little. Actually, you know what? I'll just show you really quick <laughs> because I've been talking about it. And this is my new portable painter setup. My gouache one, I believe, is downstairs. Opera Rose uses dye with the pigment. Dyes aren't light fast. Yeah, and I know sometimes they add fluorescence as well in the opaque paints. So this is watercolor. This is gouache. And these little pans that fit in that, this used to be the brush slot. Those are custom pans that you can buy directly from Portable Painter. Um, I believe, I'm not sure if they sell those on Amazon um, or like what the deal is with internet, um, Europe. <laughs> What's the deal with Europe? But I got like a bulk collection of them that I still use. And I'll, if I change colors, I'll just like clean them out and use them again. But it makes it, makes it really fun so I can have like this hybrid palette out with me. I just filled this. That's why it's brand new shiny. <laughs> ah, I can't wait to use it. I lost my old watercolor one, which was a huge bummer. I think I lost it when I was traveling, but I also have one that's just dry gouache, which is really, really fun. Um, any idea when the first one will be shipped? The first subscription box will hopefully be shipped in January. Do they sell the brush wells micro pans on Amazon USA? Oh, they do sell them on Amazon USA. Okay. Yeah, good. Um, okay, so next we're mixing this color with black. Which is like a very deep magenta y kind of tone. But I, no, not magenta. What would I call that? It's like deep cranberry. No, I <laughs> don't know what you would call it. It's, ooh, wine red. How's that? Deep wine red. <laughs> Did you try using metallic paint on your drawing? I have rarely used metallic paint. I do sometimes do that. Usually if I'm making, um, actually when I was doing a lot of my bigger acrylic pieces, I was using bronze quite often because it looked really beautiful mixed with colors, especially in beach scenes. Um, sometimes I do like Christmas cards and things like that. And I love metallics for that. And actually one of the months of the boxes, you're gonna get three metallic gouaches copper, silver, and rich gold for, cause we'll be doing uh, holiday cards that month. So yeah, but we'll, we'll swatch those in a bit. It is, a f it is fun. I have to admit, I do, I don't do it often, but when I do, it's, it's enjoyable. So this is a lizard and crimson, definitely more transparent. Uh, this is PR 83. Sometimes it's called permanent alizarin crimson. This is just alizarin crimson, different companies, different names. Yeah, holiday cards will be fun. I'm trying to think of some fun designs for those. Will the brushes be available for purchase at some point after the subscription? I hope so. I've been talking to them about different ideas. Like we have a lot of ideas jumping around. Uh, for now, obviously, it's still the month-to-month -month gouache tutorial boxes, but, like, I thought it would be so fun sometime to do 
a themed box in the future. Like this is a forest theme with all my favorite forest colors and a few brushes I love with forests or something like that with like eight to 10 colors. Um, you know, I don't know. But in terms of brushes being available f for individual sale, it's possible and we can maybe select different ones that are in the other brush set I have. Oh, which reminds me, let me test out something in chat. Oh, dang it. I don't know. I tried to set up Nightbot so that it would post my links when I did commands like that, but it's not. So let's try there it is. I had to manually enter it. <laughs> All right, back to work. So next we're going to dilute this a little. I, crimson, alizarin crimson used to be my go-to mixing red. I love it, but I, I started using different reds over the last couple of years to kind of change things up a bit. And yeah, I just, it makes such fun. It makes beautiful purples, really intense mixes. Next, we're going to mix it with white. It's a very versatile red as well. And it's a beautiful pink mixed with white. slightly more violet than this one. A lizard in crimson. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> if someone makes their own paint, will you please name it a lizard in crimson? <laughs> like make the color names what it sounds like, not what it is. <laughs> mauve <laughs> oh wait whoops let's mix with black before we move on i have a bit of black left in there oh man this is like vampire lipstick okay so that's that next is one of my favorites primary magenta um, also quinacridone magenta looks basically the same. It's such a good mixing color. If you're going for more of like the CMYK thing, this is your color. I've basically stained my desk with color already. Um, oh, and then the, oops, the boxes, let me post a link for the boxes as well so that we don't miss that. Okay, um, next we're doing, yeah, we're on the primary magenta still. Oops. This one is a little more transparent. I can see that already, even with a second layer. Um, but it makes for a gorgeous mixing color. If I had to choose one red I could use forever, it would probably be primary or quinacridone magenta because it's so versatile. And later when we do a little color mixing, you can see the huge variety you can make with it. And you can even make red with it. So like you don't need that plus a red on your palette if you're going for minimalism. Dang, look at that diluted. That is intense. Uh, 
It's PR 81. Qu Quinacridone magenta, I believe, is PR 122 usually. That's kind of rosy pink. Pretty intense. Now with some white. Lovely dusty rose kind of. Actually, I'd say that's dusty rose. This is a little more violet-y. Seems kind of shiny. No, that just, it isn't dry yet. When it dries, you'll see it goes opaque like the others. Are you sure you need to, to include opera? That is super bright. Okay, just wait. Just you wait. <laughs> we'll do opera next and you'll see. God, don't let me down, opera. I've built you up so much now. <laughs> don't make me look like a fool. Okay, now let's mix this with some black and it's kind of like a violet actually, which makes sense because black is more bluish so yeah this is gorgeous like I would seriously use this as a purple in my palette <laughs> will absolute beginners be able to follow the tutorials or do you need certain skills no you don't need any skills I will show you the way Okay, next we have opera. What? What a sing. Oh, I'm blinded. I don't even know if my camera is going to be able to show it. Do it justice. That's the thing, actually. Um, when you scan works that contain rose opera or similar kind of fluorescent colors, it usually turns out uh, sort of desaturated looking and gray because the scanner doesn't capture that fluorescence. <laughs> um, so usually you have to take a photo of it to do it justice. Oh man, honestly, I'll take a photo of this and share it on Instagram or stories or something, but it, I can't, I can barely just, it is so bright. <laughs> it is so intense. So let's dilute it a little. And then mix it with some white. Well, yeah, in the first month, the first month box is going to include a like gouache basics lesson. So it's like, if you've never used it, here's what you need to know. Here's some good techniques to practice to kind of get you used to it. Um, and then we go from there. So it's probably one of those box or one of those lessons where you can watch over and over again as you practice and like do it again in two months or three months or four months and learn more from it. Cause as your skills progress, you start to, they build on each other and you start, you start to be able to do new things as you go. And then it, it's a kind of a subconscious growth. <laughs> Is it the entire color that fades or just the fluorescence that disappears? It depends. I've seen swatches of like watercolors and various brands that look just completely gray. So I guess you can still see that what there was paint there, but there's not any color left. But that's why I want to make my own light fast swatches, light fast test sheets because I don't really trust what I see online so much unless there's some things that you can kind of trust, but I just like to do my own. Um, and I put all my results from my light fast tests on my gouache database, which is free. 
Uh, and you can find that on my Fearless Brush website. That's a beautiful purple as well. Okay, so we have quinacridone red, carmine, a lizard in crimson, primary magenta, and opera. Next, we are going to do the blues. Okay. Yeah, it is a shame. It's one of those things where you just have to accept it for what it is. It fades in sunlight, so you can use it in sketches and no problem. Stuff in your sketchbook will be fine. If you scan your art and sell prints of it, that's totally fine. But it's just if you sell originals, it's. It, I feel like you have a responsibility to let your buyers know that one of the colors may fade in time because that could potentially change the entire look of the painting. And it's like, I feel like they should know what they're buying. <laughs> okay. Blues. Oh my god, I'm so excited. I love blue. I love blue and green. Turquoise. So we have, let's start with the darker ones. We have Prussian blue. Um, actually, no, I'll start with ultramarine because that's kind of warm. And then we have some greenish blue. So Prussian blue. Then we'll go with, oh, this is tricky. I'll go with then I'll go with cobalt, then I'll go with Prussian, and then these are all kind of phthalos. So I'll go with primary cyan, then cerulean, then turquoise. Okay. I have one clean water dish left, but my palette is quite... So here's my palette. You can see, unless I poured a really thin blob <laughs> they're all still wet so i'm kind of using this as a test to see how long they stay wet dry or wet in open air usually they dry fast when i do it on this kind of this palette so we'll see i'll set that aside um, but we'll be able to use that for mixing a little bit later it'll be a good test Usually I just spritz it with water and it kind of reactivates and works just fine. I may squeeze some fresh paint if it's too thin though. Or how do you organize and store all of your swatch cards? I keep them all in a drawer. Separated by either paper clip or alligator clips like some of them are actually hanging on my wall the ones I use frequently like this is my watercolor palette um actually I need to add a couple colors to this uh but I keep this on my wall next to my desk at all times and this one this is my color mixing chart for my Winsor Newton or no actually this is this this was my desert island palette <laughs> not limited really but it's all sorts of brands we have some shinhan we have some schminka some windsor newton yeah we have a lot of brands in here but it was like my favorite colors at the time from each brand or from from each colors but oh like i just love charts like this this is when you kind of go ocd crazy <laughs> when you do a chart like this and i'm just not there mentally right now so that's why we're making a mess today. But those sure do look good on the wall. All right. Let's do. What do you do when you when you don't know what color to use in your sketch? For example, in a fantasy sketch. Uh, so I usually use a limited palette. 
and that takes a lot of guesswork out. So if I know I only have one blue, one red, one yellow, white, black, maybe a brown or something, I can only mix so many colors with that. And I usually, in a fantasy sketch, you can use any color you want for any object. <laughs> That's the fun part. Um, so I would say don't, don't let it be too precious. Try a color, see if you like it. Let's say you're painting trees. Maybe you want to make your tree trunks purple. Try it. See if you like it, if it works in that piece. If not, you could change it or move on or just do something different next time. A lot of that, when you ask that question, it makes me think like you haven't tried enough things because if you're afraid to try it or you don't know what to try, it, it all comes down to experience. I've tried so many different combinations now that I feel like I have an idea of what will happen if I do a certain thing. And so I paint way more intuitively nowadays. Sorry, I meant to say this is Ultramarine Deep, which is PB29. One of my go-to favorite colors. And we'll dilute it. And drag it down a little and then mix it with white. Excited for that turquoise. Yes, me too. Um, I did not think you used non light fast colors. So was it Shinhan that you said you had to use Prussian blue opera and so on in the known non light fast colors? No, they didn't tell me to do anything. I specifically wanted to use I chose as many light fast colors as I possibly could, but I knew I wanted to have X amount of colors over the course of the months. Like, I think it's like 30 something colors. And it, there's only so many I could choose that were like completely light fast. As I got towards the end of my numbers, I was like, mm, I have space for five more colors. There aren't really any more options for totally light fast things. So instead I went with colors that I thought it would be really good for people to try. So colors I might not use myself all the time, but I used when I first started and it helped me learn so much about color and mixing. And, and I think having them as an option is really good when you're first starting or when you're trying different color combinations. So even though I personally don't use a lot of non light fast colors, I still find them valuable sometimes. And also if you are painting, you're learning, you're doing sketches, light fastness doesn't matter at all. You're not hanging those up on your wall for, for years to come. It is purely about learning. So that's definitely something I'll talk about in the lessons because I want to obviously educate people on that side of things as well. I think it's a really important thing to know, but I don't think it should stop anyone from trying something they haven't tried yet. And it kind of opens your eyes to new things when you try things you're not used to. And that's part of the box. Like one of my ideas with the boxes is to be fearless, to, to have a sense of play, a sense of wonder, like excitement. I don't want any particular rule to hold anyone back. So I'll share the rules I know and share how they can help. Um, but I also want to really encourage that sense of sense of play really. I think that is so, so, so important, especially when you're first starting, because I, I know from experience and I know from all the comments on my videos that fear can really hold people back. I know I'm going deep right now, <laughs> but um, I'm just trying to say I've seen it so many times in the comments, like, how did you know how to do that? Why did you do that? I thought you weren't supposed to do that. And like, you know, people get caught up on rules so much. And I do think they're important at times. I think knowing the rules is important before you break them. <laughs> so that's kind of something I focus on a lot in my tutorials. Um, but I also think I would have burned out and not kept painting if I felt stifled by following rules and like, oh, I'm not allowed to do that because that's just not what you do. You know, I mean, I'm sure I'm not the only one 
who has felt that way. Oops, not enough pigment. So black and ultramarine looks a lot like indigo. You could probably get confused by that if you didn't know. Also, I think my screen is showing these a, li a little bit more green. This is more of a, a deeper blue than it is green. <laughs> it's not green at all. <laughs> I don't know. Is that just my monitor? Is it, is, does it look blue to you guys? It might just be my monitor. What gouache watercolor paper should you buy for your lessons? Um, well, the paper, there's paper included in my gouache boxes, so if that's what you're talking about. But if you're just on your own, doing your own thing, I recommend for gouache, I recommend not something super expensive. Like something I use all the time for gouache is Dollar Rownie. It's a brand here that's like everywhere, even in craft stores. And it's not 100% cotton or anything. It's kind of smooth. It has a little bit of tooth to it, but the gouache sort of sits on top and it, I love it for gouache because sometimes if you use really, really textured 100% cotton watercolor paper, it can kind of interfere with your paint flow. And especially if you're trying to create really, really crisp lines <clears throat> with your gouache, it's not that it's a bad thing. It's just different. So I find it's easier to use something like dollar Rownie. Let's see if I have this. Yeah, here. This is um, Dollar Rowney Aquafine Smooth Watercolor Paper. And it's 100% cellulose, not cotton. It's This is the hot press. They also have, I think they have a more textured version as well. But it's like my go-to for gouache. Unless in my sketchbooks, I pretty much only buy like heavy duty watercolor sketchbooks nowadays, like my Etcher and my Strathmore, which I still have a few of. Um, well, my, my Stillman and Burn one isn't. It's more of a cellulose smooth paper. And I love that as well. But for me, gouache doesn't require 100% cotton. So you don't have to spend too much. Lots of indigos are made that way. Yeah, it makes, looks just like it. So makes sense. <laughs> Next we have cobalt blue, PB28. Ooh, yeah. This is one of those colors that will dry really hard. It's very, very opaque. Um, not quite as flowy. Of course, if you add water, it flows beautifully, but it is very opaque. So let's dilute that down. Walmart near you has those pa pads. Yeah, it's so it's everywhere here. It's like one of the cheaper options. I think it's made. I think it's, I don't know. Is it made in the UK? Is that why? I think it is. Okay, let's get some white. Oh, gorgeous sky color. Also good for water reflections. Hello, Sandy. Um, so if I missed anybody's question, please feel free to ask again. It's, that's one of the trickiest things about streaming is not missing anything in chat, <laughs> but while still keeping the brush going, so while still keeping the, the paint going. <laughs> Another very indigo-y color. I think that's kind of going to be the name of the game in terms of black plus blue. Canson XL mixed media or watercolor paper from Michaels for your cheaper paper. Excellent. Do you find you use a lot more gouache when you first started? You feel like, I feel like I just blew through my first tube of primary yellow. <laughs> um, let's 
see. Let me think back. I used, a f yeah, I would say yellow, yellow, white, of course. Yellow and blue, I always go through the most quickly, but I used, uh, what was it? Holbein gouache, Hol Holbein artist gouache when I first started. And that is extremely highly pigmented and opaque for the most part. Um, so those tubes lasted me so long. Actually, I used them for ages and then I stopped using, I used other types of paint for a long time. And the, a few of my Holbein tubes went rock hard, <laughs> which really sucked. <laughs> but, you know, I just neglected them and probably didn't tie them on tight, uh, put the caps on tightly. Um, so I, what was I saying? <laughs> oh yeah, I went through them. I, I wasted a few of those, which was sad, but now I feel like I don't go through them as quickly because I tend to dilute for my first couple layers, which doesn't use as much paint. And then I build up the thickness on top of that. But I will say if you are a painter who uses thick layers, you probably would go through tubes pretty quick because um, like if you're mixing, uh, it, there's certain styles and techniques with gouache where you layer thick colors or use thick colors next to each other. Uh, I don't, I'm trying to think of an artist off the top of my head and I can't think of one right now, but I would say you'd probably use a lot more that way. But if you do my kind of style where I use more thin down washes at first and then build up the thickness, you go through way less paint. Um. Hey, Lindsay. So next we're mixing with a little blue, uh, with white. Oh wait, I didn't need dilute it. Gosh, here, get this off my brush. <laughs> Losing my track of my mind. Okay, now let's dilute this. After this blue card, I'm going to have to take a quick break to get better, uh, to get fresh water because my water is very muddy right now. And then we'll do all the greens and purples and earthy tones. Oops. Okay. Prussian blue used to be my go-to blue because it creates such intense mixes. It's one of those that does, actually, it's a weird one it will get kind of desaturated in sunlight if it's up like in bright sunlight. But then if you put it back in a drawer, a dark drawer or something, it regains its color. Very, very odd. Next, oh, and by the way, Prussian blue is PB27. I don't know if I mentioned that. Next is primary cyan and it's PB15 colon three. That's basically phthalo blue. So we have our swatch. It's relatively opaque. Yeah. Dilute it down. This is a very bright like you'd, it's not fluorescent, but it certainly leans that way in some light. Actually, I think this is my dollar roundy paper. I couldn't remember. I found these A5 sheets in my drawer and I was like, yeah, I'll just use those. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it's my, my dollar roundy hot press. I would never use it for watercolor. That would do my nut in. I, okay, I forgot the black one. Wow. Ma, I'm off my rocker with these colors. Now you go for Mayan blue. 
in my defense, this Prussian blue is already super, super dark. So this is basically just going to look black. <laughs> so there you go. It'll be more visible once it's matte, once it dries matte. Now we'll do our white and lovely bright sky color. Really pretty. I always forget how pretty it is mixed with white. <laughs> then we have it with black. Uh, does it help to pour your paints in a palette and use them from there? Or <clears throat> or have less, does have less, ugh, have less waste. Uh, depends if you're using a dried palette or a wet palette, but I like to use a stay wet palette for like when I'm painting, I'll often get my stay wet palette, which is, oh, here's, <laughs> well, I'll show you after. Um, but basically it seals airtight and my palette is inside it. All my colors are inside it and like all the mixes as well. So it stays fresh between uses like a day or two. And then I can continue painting and it saves my paint, saves my mixes. Um, or if I'm using a dried gouache palette, it doesn't matter. It'll just dry between uses anyway. And I just reactivate it when I want to use it again. Or you can use one of those airtight palettes with the, like these where you pour the paint in and you close it and it's airtight. That will keep your paint wet for ages. I do have videos about all that on my channel. If you want to scroll down and look through my gouache videos. Next is Cerulean Blue. Excuse me. That's a PB35. Oh God, no, I squeezed too much. <laughs> oh well. Maybe for one of my limited palettes we'll mix with this one because I just squeezed out so much on my palette. <laughs> this is very opaque and thicker than some of the others. <laughs> Hello, Faith. It making me anxious for the boxes. Yeah, you can always rewatch the stream later if you want to go back and watch the beginning or whenever. It'll be on my channel. Is it best to buy these paints in a set or individually? It totally depends on, on you, on what you need. I mean, when I first started, I bought so much. I bought so many colors. Um, yeah, I... I bought too many, to be honest. And what I recommend more for beginners is to uh, buy primaries of each in whatever brands you like. So red, yellow, and blue, plus white, plus black. Maybe a burnt umber would be useful. Maybe a turquoise would be useful or a phthalo blue of some kind. And just practice your own color mixing rather than buying so many different tubes because there's so many convenience there's like so many tubes of green and purple and all these colors that uh, it can get very overwhelming and you squeeze them all out in your palette and then you end up with like a hot mess on your painting because you're using all these so many colors <laughs> it can be fun though i mean i don't want to say not to do that it's just i learned the hard way i wish i had started with primaries <laughs> Next, we'll mix this with white. Lovely, slightly more. Um, is it what I say? Desat yeah, I guess it's a slightly more desaturated sky blue than the primary cyan. It's still bright, though. You have mold nightmares with moldy stay wet palette videos. <laughs> oh, you're welcome, Karen. 
I, tr I try to answer all the questions I see. Sometimes I miss something, but I have to admit, I have been very overwhelmed with comments the last few months. Um, so like my new strategy is to, when I post a video for the next like 24 hours, I'll try to monitor the comments and answer as many as I can. Um, but then, yeah, I get very, very overwhelmed <laughs> and every now and then I can go and read through as many as I can and like heart them and stuff like that. But it's not as easy as it used to be. I try to answer questions at least, but live streams are great because you can answer and I can see right away. <laughs> so now we have one of my all time favorites, turquoise. This one is cobalt turquoise. PB28, like 90% of my clothing and bags and things I own are turquoise. That's why I chose this color for my brush handle. <laughs> Obsessed. Oh, it's just, I think ever since I moved to Scotland and I've seen this, this, the ocean, the sea, and I've painted coastal scenes, turquoise became my, my color. Because before that, I was definitely into like, I think I was into purple for the longest time. Let's dilute that. And then we'll mix it with some white. I don't know anything about Chinese painting colors. How much white or black do you add to make your swatch? Um, it's kind of a visual mix. I want it to be light. So it's different than that swatch. So I'll add white until it looks lighter than that. And then I'll add black so it looks darker. <laughs> it looks like a visual thing, a visual reference. This one was challenging though, because it's, this is already such a dark color. The second I added the tiny bit of black, it went really dark, obviously. So yeah, I want to, I want you to be able to, I want to be able to see how the black affects the color and the white. And that's my goal as I do this. When we get into the color mixing pages in a little bit, then I'll try, I'll try to make like more variations, but this is just meant to be like a quick reference guide. So if I'm in the mood for a coastal painting, I'll grab this p sheet of paper and I'll be like, mm, okay, I want turquoise and cobalt or, you know, just quickly reference it based on my mood. You could be really scientific with it. And I mean, there's a lot of different ways to make swatches and color mixing charts. Just do what works for you. The whole point is that it's useful to you. Now we'll get some black. Oops, too much black. It's kind of a grayish turquoise. Deep, slightly desaturated, deeper turquoise. Really pretty. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. I am going to take, well, actually let me write the names and then we'll take a couple minutes, get some fresh water. This is ultra deep cobalt Prussian primary cyan Oh God. Oh no. Okay. I forgot. This was a, f <laughs> I was like, no, I did it out of order. <laughs> uh, cerulean cobalt turquoise. Oops. Cool. All right, everyone, um, go grab a drink, grab a snack, get a little stretch break and we'll meet back here in like five minutes or less. I'll put my BRB screen on. So you know that when I'm back, I'm back. Okay. See you soon.
Hello, hello. I was fast. Okay, let's dive into the... Oh my gosh, sorry. I knocked over my empty iced coffee. I guess that'll wake everyone up. Uh, let's dive into the greens and purples. A very fun combination, if you ask me. <laughs> So I'm going to do purple on the left and then we'll do greens. Don't really know what order I want to do it in, but that's just, we'll just do that. Hello, James. <laughs> Thanks for the reminder. Hit the like button. Yeah, that's great. Mm, do you prefer gouache straight from the tube or dry it in a palette? Oh man, that is so hard to choose. <laughs> ah, okay. If I'm painting outside, I prefer dried gouache at the moment because it's so convenient. And I use toned paper a lot when I'm outside because the brightness of the paper, if I'm using white paper outside, the light reflects off the paper and makes me, my, my eyes hurt after a while toned paper or beige paper is a little more friendly, especially in bright light. So I, I just got in the habit of using toned paper outside. And for the longest time, I was paranoid that dried gouache wouldn't reactivate opaquely enough to be visible on toned paper, but it is like at least the professional brands are. So I have no reason not to. It's just so convenient. And if I'm inside, I definitely prefer to use from the tube because it's fresh and I can mix, I can make bigger mixes and I'm usually painting a little bit bigger in the studio. So they both have their love in my heart. I both, I have love for both of them. If I only could use one forever, I would have to go with dried gouache in my portable painter because I prefer to paint outside. So I guess there's that. All right, we have fresh water. And we're going to start with Cobalt Violet Hue P, or BV11. And so usually I, I don't have a tube of purple or a tube of green in my palette. I, pre, I, I mix my own. Sometimes I'll custom mix something from what's already in my palette and give it its own little pan. But... I have to say these tubes are gorgeous. <laughs> I'm really excited. And sometimes it's just fun to play with new colors. So I can't wait to see what we can do with these. I used to buy a lot of pre-mixed greens back in the day, a couple purples. Mmm. Um, and I'm not sure. Oh yeah. Okay. This one is a little bit thicker. Like I have to really get my brush in there to get it softened up. It's a little gooey feeling. <laughs> so we will dilute it down. It's quite bright. That's a fun color though. BB11, guessing it's another fugitive. Maybe we'll see. It says light fastness three, which is one of their higher ratings. So, I mean, cobalt is usually quite light fast, but it is a hue. That's the thing. So we'll see. I'm going to make my own light fast tests. Do my own research. Actually, I need to stop my previous light fast tests. I think it's been eight months? No, actually I'll check what how long it's been up there, but I don't have enough room in my windows. <laughs> like I don't, I need more windows to do more light fast tests. So I don't like, I want to do the light, the Shinhan light fast test for like four months and get a good idea for it. Cause usually kind of, you already, you see results within four months, maybe six if you want to push it. But if it's not fading within that time, it's usually fine didn't put enough white in there. 
is a fun color. This would be really fun to play with in a forest. I love mixing purples and greens in a forest. You want to paint your house with that color. You love mixing purple and green for dull blues. Oh, yes. I love the combination of blues, or sorry, purples and greens in a forest scene. Now we'll mix it with some black. That's beautiful. Oh, that's, oh, I want to paint my house in this color. <laughs> It'll be this color with a turquoise roof. That would, no, never mind. That would be, I couldn't do that. <laughs> my, my paper towel, this color and this color, this is the, the turquoise I used previously. I don't like that combination. <laughs> I like so, more subtle combinations. Next we have lilac. That's PV15 and PW6. So it's kind of a desaturated light purple. Reminds me of lavender watercolor. Like I have a lavender watercolor by Daniel Smith that looks very similar to this. And I never was a lavender person until I went to the workshop with Ian Stewart and he gave us all a little dollop of lavender in our palettes and I'm obsessed now. <laughs> like it just mixes so beautifully with everything, especially for coastal scenes. I can't get enough of it now. So I bought a whole tube of it when I got home. And that's another reason I have to update my watercolor palette chart. Perlin green with reds, purples. Yeah, perlin green is so fun. I used to use that color all the time. Um, I still have quite a few. I have various uh, watercolor tubes of that in different brands. Uh, what am I doing? Oh, I need to dilute it. So the reason I like to dilute it is because, like I said, I do sometimes use wet washes on my first layer, but also sometimes in the diluted section of the paint, you can see undertones of the colors that are involved in the tube. Like maybe there's a tube that has two or three pigments in it. Sometimes the diluted area will show more yellow or more pink. Um, it'll kind of give you a feeling for the richness of the color that might not be noticeable when it's just a pure swatch. That is especially true for watercolor. Um, I'm just mixing more white. It's already got white in it, <laughs> so it doesn't really help much to do that, but I'm being consistent. <laughs> now we have some black, which gives us a very gray purple. Light gray. That's beautiful, actually. I really like that one. Do a mixing chart from purple and green. Never thought of mixing those. Yeah, we could do. Th oh, let's definitely do one with the lilac. We'll see what these other greens are like. I'll, I'll give a little space between those. Next we have um, Viridian, which is PG7. It's basically phthalo green. I believe Viridian and Moss Green are in the second box because of that one is all about mixing greens and showing the differences between having tube greens versus mixing your own greens. That's going to be a fun lesson. Hey, Sarah. Bluish black mixed with lilac makes the prettiest gray. Ooh, that sounds lovely. So here is our Viridian. I can't not think of Ghibli when I see this color. Like every artist who does Ghibli paintings uses phthalo green and they all look the same to me. 
Not that it's a bad thing. It's just, it's that look. It just looks like it. If you, if you search online, you'll know what I mean. Then dilute it. It's like such a gorgeous kind of bright emerald. Do you think manufacturers are bummed out that they uh, can't really name the colors what they want to name them? Like you could call it so many pretty th names, em emerald something, but they know that artists will be annoyed that it's not the, the pigment name, <laughs> like what it's commonly known as. I know some brands do that. They will just name it whatever they want and it's fun. And then they'll also include the pigment numbers. But I think most of the professional brands by now are kind of like they stick to the classic naming system, unless it's a, con a special mixed color. Moss green looks right up your alley. Yeah, moss green. I bought when I bought my first set of gouache back in the day it was the Holbein gouache. I think they had a moss green as well. And I was just like using it all the time. I used it with everything. They are so strong, yes, but phthalos are so strong. But if you go into it with a mindset of, I'm never going to use this color on its own. I'm always going to mix it with something. It is one of the most fun colors to have on your palette. Like, I know, I know I always talk about coastal scenes, but mixing that into a little bit of black, into a little bit of your brown, into your blues, like you just end up with such rich, beautiful colors but it is a challenge because it ends up getting everywhere. I've never <laughs> used, I've never had it in my palette without it getting on everything. Like you squeeze it out on your palette and everything's fine. And then you're done with your painting session and you're like, why is my leg and arm covered in phthalo green? <laughs> what happened? All right, let's get some black in there. Lovely. Next, I am really excited about this color. It's called Shadow Pale, uh, Shadow Green Pale. Oh, there's a lot of pigments. Okay. PG-17, PBK-11, and PW-18. <laughs> but obviously it's a convenience mix. It's just for, for mixing. This is like something you would mix up among your palette with all your grays and leftover colors, but this is in the tube conveniently for you. So let's see. It's a little bit goopy. Ooh, but wow, that's opaque. It's so fluid out of the tube. I didn't think it would be that opaque. That's a nice um, grayish green. Not quite gray because it still has a lot of color. Uh, I don't know. It's just a, it's almost like a terra verte ish green, earthy green maybe, but with a little gray. Oh, I just, it's really pretty <laughs> in person. Is it showing? I know the colors get are shiny when they're wet, but yeah, yeah, it's it's that's gonna be a fun one to mix with other things, or just like hints of that in your forest. But it could be for it, yeah, you could use it for water lakes. Um, let's see with white. I mean, this is something I would paint my walls with. That, that's beautiful. 
And then we'll see with some black. Um, oops. Definitely a gray. It's like a desaturated version of that, which is to be expected. Really pretty. Those two could be my whole house inside. <laughs> And then we're getting into the bright greens. So we have moss green next. I <laughs> doubt you can resist. <laughs> Let's see. I've already used this one a fair bit. So I'm a little more familiar with it. It's very opaque. Oops. When it's diluted, it's much more of a yellowish green. Just like all of my yellows mixed with black, really similar to that. So. When you dilute it a lot, you can, it, that, lighter bit is really really yellow it like pulls the yellow out of the color um because it's actually py3 and pbr6 oops now let's get some white in there gorgeous There we go. <laughs> oh, th yay, I'm excited that you'll get to use them. Thank you. Next, we'll make some black in there, which will desaturate it even more. I really like it with black. It doesn't, it's not quite as yellowy. Kind of almost cools it off a little bit. Then we have cadmium green pale. PY35 PG7. <laughs> oh, she gorgeous. Yeah, we have a lot of pretty colors today. This one seems kind of neon, I'm not going to lie. Well, we'll see. <laughs> uh, when will your first box be delivered if you order pre-ordered? Hopefully January. I wanted to say December, but, you know, with the holiday rush, a lot of manufacturers are busy. <laughs> are, are, I don't want to overpromise, if you know what I mean. So if we are, let's say if we're lucky, maybe December. But I would say let's shoot for January because then maybe we'll think um, we can think of it as a new year project. That's really opaque. And quite bright. So let's dilute it down and see how it goes. This is making my water look like uh, radioactive slime <laughs> like it's in it's so so neon green looking in the in the water <laughs> i don't know if the camera's gonna pick it up uh, and then we'll get some white oh that's so nice to hear that you like the brushes <laughs> i I mean, I'm biased, obviously. I made them. I, I, I mean, I designed 
them to work exactly how I wanted them to work. So they suit me perfectly, but I was just so happy to see more and more people are finding them really useful for gouache. Don't forget to treat them well though. Make sure you don't leave any water on your brush, like dry it off as best you can, store them flat until they're totally, totally dry. Um, every once in a while, maybe give them a nice clean with some brush soap. I like using the master's brush cleaner, soap conditioner stuff. I used to use it for oil and acrylic and I, it works great in all brushes. Um, but yeah, mine have, mine have been lasting really well and I use them basically every day. So that's my, my routine for my brushes. Okay, now mix with some black. It's a nice color. I really don't ever use green straight out of the tube or purples, but mixed with a little white or black or mixed into other colors, they are wonderful. So we have cobalt. Violet hue, lilac, viridian, shadow, pale, moss green, cad green, Pale. What else? Oh, now we need to do our earthy tones and then we'll do some color mixing. So I'm going to set this mixing tray aside. Hopefully don't step on it. <laughs> I can see myself doing that. Aw, that's exciting, Kathy. <laughs> Last set. So now we have burnt umber, burnt sienna, copper, gold, and silver. earthy tones. Floki coming in. Oh no. Yeah. I have to watch out for that. He's sleeping in the bedroom. Hopefully I'll hear him if he jumps down. Cause he sounds like a cannonball every time he jumps down off of something. <laughs> but yeah, that would be very messy to clean up. First, we have Burnt Umber, which is PR 101. Oops. Uh, very opaque, which is to be expected. So now dilute that. This is such a useful color. Um, oh gosh, yeah. If you only buy the primaries, I'd and black and white, I always suggest adding burnt umber if you can. Out of all the browns, it's definitely my favorite. It mixes beautifully with so many colors. What about hydrangea blue? What is a hydrangea blue? Like I can't picture it in my head. What time is it in Scotland now? It is just about 7 p.m. here. How about where you are? It's morning in the U.S. still, right? Or no, maybe it's early afternoon. Here we have with some white. Basically, the easiest way to make sand color is burnt umber and white. 
What is your thought on yellow ochre being an earth tone group? Yeah, it's totally an earthy tone, but I grouped it with my yellows because it I use it as a yellow sometimes, but it is very earthy for sure. You could definitely put that with your browns. It would make sense. Eleven, two, three, one. So now we'll mix it with some black, which is just going to probably look almost black. And then we have burnt sienna. Actually, burnt sienna used to be my favorite brown. Sometimes I would even use it as the red in my palette, which is a really interesting challenge. It, it creates very muted paintings. So this is burnt sienna, which is PR 101 PO 34. then dilute it down as you'll see why I'd use it as a red. It's a, I mean, it is more orangey, but it's got that red undertone. It looks, to me, it looks just like Cornacridone Burnt Orange by Daniel Smith, one of my favorites. <laughs> Let's see, that, that color. It's basically the same as that. But yeah, I tend to not use it so much anymore. I like to change things up every couple years. So at one point I was like, okay, it's time to explore other things. But it's another great mixing color for a lot of things. Um, like burnt sienna with white, as you can see, is a really perfect sand tone. So if you want to have a pre-mixed pan of beach <laughs> in your palette, go with that. <laughs> this is more of a muted version. This is that kind of, if the sun is out, maybe, maybe even more white than that though. And then with black. Looks a lot like burnt umber. So we have the um, metallics next. This will be fun. Let's see how metallic they actually are. First is co uh, pearl copper. And PW20. Interesting. I always wondered how they named or what pigments they use in these. So this is pearl copper. Wow, that's thick. That's that's very opaque. You know what fascinates me about iridescent gouache is that gouache dries matte. So it has that matte quality, but it's metallic. Like how does that work? <laughs> it, it It's both. I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> Let's dilute it and see what happens. I don't think I've ever done that. I'll uh, try to get it down into very diluted. Let's see. So obviously it's going to be shiny. But from certain angles, it looks totally matte. This actually, that would be a really fun color to like mix a dollop of that in with your sandy earthy tones. I could see that being fun for a beach scene. 
Um, also, it has a lot of granulation, which I guess is to be expected. So if you dilute it, you get that added texture. That's fun. Now we have rich gold. Ooh. I think they had a couple different golds, but I liked the look of rich gold. Ooh, oh my gosh. Interesting. It's hard to show because of the glare, but it's beautiful in person. It's not quite like a vibrant yellowy gold. Like, I don't know how to describe it. Um, Ooh, I like it a lot when I dilute it. This could be so fun for like an underpainting, doing a bit of the metallic in the underpainting, maybe in a scene where some of that's gonna peek through. That would be fun. I'm, I've just not, I don't have a ton of experience with metallics, but I do think they would be really fun for, for holiday cards or something more specific, or maybe like moon, like a moonscape. This is silver. Oh, by the way, rich gold is PB or sorry, PW20 and PW6. That's interesting. Silver is PW20 and PW6. What? Is that the same? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how the pigments work in these, but I don't have a lot of experience with metallics. I just know there are certain things they're fun for. Wow, that's actually really opaque too. Um, yeah. Let's see what it looks like diluted. Oh, I'm going to mix them with white and black as well. I forgot. I'll do that in a second. It's interesting when you dilute them because the pigments are heavier or something. Like they feel... I bet on 100% cotton watercolor paper with a lot of texture, cold press or something, this would be really cool to dilute these because there's granulation and the pigments are heavier. That's fun. Um, yeah, using it with sand could be a lot of fun. Even a combination of these two, let's mix it with white and see how it looks. I think, I think that'll be a good indicator. it would work well. Swatch nerds, can you recommend an easy, really easy to rewet burnt umber in watercolor? Struggle to find one, maybe Mgram. I am using Daniel Smith lately and mine rewets beautifully. I really like it. Maybe it depends how long it's been on your palette. <laughs> okay, this is the pearl copper mixed with white. We'll see in a second if it ends up still looking metallic. So far it doesn't seem super metallic anymore. M gram and it rewets very easily. That's good to know. I bet, oh my gosh, you guys, I was cleaning out my drawers the other day and I found a handful of old half pans full of colors I used to use all the time. One of those, and I haven't touched those in probably, they've probably been in there for two years. I, one of them is quinacridone, sorry, anthraquinone blue by M. Graham. And my finger, like I, I tried to pick it up and my finger went into the pan and it was completely wet still. Like it, I had just poured it. It was just gooey. It got everywhere. And obviously it's one of those really like staining colors. I was just like, what? How? <laughs> it's madness. So I actually stopped using Mgram for that reason because I take my stuff outside all the time and I throw it in my bag and 
like I'm just I'm just not a very stationary painter. <laughs> I was always getting it everywhere and I love the idea of it. I just for me personally it's just not practical. Um, oh wow I love that. This is the pearl copper mixed with black and I can definitely see a bit of the shine metallic coming through at least when it's wet. The white mix is not really metallic at all anymore. So that's interesting. The honey binder for you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like I get it. That's the point, right? That's why they do that. They want it to re-wet beautifully and oh, I get it. <laughs> but Oh my gosh. I was just like <laughs> two years, maybe even more and it's not dry or even close to dry. Like I thought maybe it would be tacky, but nope, it is straight up goo. That's a interesting combo. Let's try it with black. Ooh, interesting. It's like a greenish version. It's like um, antique gold or something. <laughs> Does M-gram gouache rewet similar to watercolor? So I have M or no, I only had two colors. I need to test out their yellow and the blue I have by them in my dried palette at some point. So far I've only tested their cobalt and the black and the white. The cobalt and the black get like rock hard <laughs> in a dry palette, but I think it's more about the pigment, not the manufacturer. Um, so I still need to test out the other ones I have, but that, that would be interesting to know. So this is the silver mixed with white. So far the white seems to, the gold is a tiny bit metallic still. The pearl is not metallic at all with white. We'll see how the silver dries. So it kind of removes the metallicness. Ooh, that's like a bluish silver. That's beautiful. A little bit metallic in the black, very metallic in the black. So far, very metallic in the black. So that's cool. Um, we'll you can kind of see it when I tilt it a little. So see how that dries completely. All right. Um, I'll do a white swatch as well. Um, just to see how opaque it is. Burn. But to be honest, I really never use white on its own unless I'm doing tiny, tiny details on top of things. And then I just use it like a little thicker and it's fine but I'm sure someone will want to see that. Oh, I wrote sliver. <laughs> I'm leaving it. <laughs> it's sliver. So now I'm gonna make some room. Oh, wait, let's quickly do that white swatch. Silver, the silver plus black would be perfect perfect for a slate roof <laughs> or even like a tin roof um, like the roof outside my window <laughs> oh my god that's way more opaque than I thought it would be okay okay uh, I'm not gonna bother diluting it at all because it's obviously gonna just disappear Um, but just wanted to see what a swatch would look like on top of the line. It's a pretty powerful primary white. Usually like I, for the longest time, I would only use my Winsor Newton pri uh, titanium white or primary white, but that's a good one. All right, let's see. Now we have to choose a limited palette and do some mixing. Done, done, 
done. Let's do the mixing and then we'll do a couple light fast strips just so I can show you how I make them and then we'll call it a day because I'm getting really hungry. <laughs> uh, first, let me move that. Let's choose a blue. All right, I'm gonna number them. One, two, three, four, five, six. Write which number you want me to use in chat. The first number to hit five votes wins. So one, two, three, four, five, six. That'll be our blue. And then, let's see. I'll still be able to use some of these. I didn't pour out a lot of blue, but I'll still be able to use some of them. Oh my God, okay. One, two, three, four, five, six wins. That was easy, six wins. One, two, three, four, five, six. Turquoise wins. Stop counting, stop numbering. We're gonna use turquoise. I wish I had kept these out. Oh, that was easy. Okay, number one. <laughs> Six, I live in Florida. Uh, next, we're gonna choose the yellows. Oops. Okay, I wrote stop in chat, not to yell at anyone, just so you know we're starting the yellows. So for the yellows, one, two, three, four, five, six. So anything you write after stop in chat is gonna be the yellow choice. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. Wow, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> stop, we got it. Number four won like instantly. That's really surprising. Okay. So you guys want permanent yellow deep. You know what? That's the last one of what I would have chose <laughs> because it's not, uh, it's more, it's more orange than anything. Of course I can't find it in my bag. <laughs> I have every other color. Permanent yellow permanent cat no lemon yellow okay while we're doing that you guys vote for the reds um one two three four five that's too warm with the cool turquoise blue you know we'll see Wait, so one, two, three, four, five. All right, let's see. First we have, ooh, this will be a close one. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five. Ooh, I think, I think four, one. Am I counting that correctly? Yeah, I think four got there first. So one, two, three, four, primary magenta. Okay. okay. I agree with you. <laughs> I'm still looking for the, oh, there we go. This will be interesting. Oops, sorry, I just hit the mic. All right, next. Don't do it yet. I know it's lagging. So we have our three. First, I'm gonna do mixes with those plus white and maybe with black. Then we're gonna choose one of the purples and we're gonna choose, actually, you know what we'll do? I'm just gonna choose the purple. We're doing lilac, <laughs> but I want you guys to choose the green. So I'll do a little mixing with the primaries plus white and maybe a little black. Then we'll do those same primaries with one of the purples and the greens to see kind of the variety we get. So one, two, three, four, vote for your green. And then I'm gonna choose a set of primary, a set of a different set of colors to mix with, something that I would use often. Or maybe I'll just surprise you and pick something crazy. Oh God, oh, okay. Let's see, one, two, three, four. Oh God, okay, stop. 
I think two one. I think two one. One, two, three, four, five. Excuse me, three, one, three. Did I do that right? Did, did, I think you guys were voting for the greens. One, two, shadow green pale. Ooh, that's interesting. I thought you'd go for the bright one. Where'd it go? <laughs> Let's. Every other color but the one I need comes out of the bag. What? I swear, I've pulled Viridian out like four times already. <laughs> See, I told you, it gets everywhere. I swear if it's, is, oh, it was the last one I pulled out. God. Okay. Now let's do some mixing. I'm gonna scrape off the dollops of paint that you guys chose so we don't waste it. So we have, actually I don't need that turquoise because it's barely there. I'll get some fresh turquoise. Save some of that. Oop. Get some of my lilac. <laughs> I'm like being so stingy with my paint suddenly. All right, these are the colors that we're doing. You excited? And then this one. So here, I'll just show you. This is the first sheet I used for the mixes. Some of them are still really wet. The ones that I didn't pour a lot out are dry, but that's to be expected. But I'm still surprised with how wet some of these are. <laughs> just get some fresh out of the tube because so on this card we're gonna do this crazy combination first these plus black and white and then we'll add a couple of these in and mix those use a stay wet palette for gouache when painting in the studio yeah usually um just easy to save your paint between uses between sessions that way don't doesn't go to waste but in this case i know i'm going to use most of what I pour out. So I'm not too worried. Okay, so what I like to do is a quick, um, I know it's gonna look crazy, but <laughs> when I'm doing my little mixing, my color mixing sheets, when I'm using a limited palette like this, I don't need to stop and label everything because I only have one yellow, one red, one blue, one, you know, black, white, whatever. 
so it's a lot more of an intuitive way of doing a, char a color mixing chart. And the over the end result is something that basically you take a quick glance at it and you know if you want to use that combination or not. I'll kind of talk you through as I go. So first I'll usually just start with my basic yellow and then mix a little white. Maybe add a little black and I'll just make um, little dots, dollops next to each color and I'll just keep going down the line. Now I'll get some blue in there. And I know because it's shifting towards blue now that I've added cobalt and I'm able to mix cooler greens. And the more I go in, the more it's going to be obvious. So in the future, when I look at this, it'll be really obvious to me that that's the yellow with a little bit of white, with a little bit of blue, 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 and it keeps going down the line. When I add black to it, it's going to get much more desaturated and deeper, which is also going to be like I just I'll, something I know when I look at it. Maybe this is not super useful if you have don't have a lot of experience with colors, but um, the longer you paint, the more obvious it is. Here, let me angle my paper up a little <laughs> so it's not so glaring. And yeah, I just keep going down. And then at the end, I get like a huge variation in color. And I'm like, wow, I didn't realize I could make all those mixes with just those three colors. Like it's always surprising. And it doesn't take very long to decipher what I mix to make a certain square. If you find a square, if you make a square that you absolutely love that you're like, okay, that's my favorite color, maybe write it down. <laughs> but to me, it's just, it's pretty obvious when you're using such a limited palette. If I had two blues, two yellows, I would do something more organized because then it's harder to like look back and see what you made. Um, but now I'm mixing some magenta in, so I know that's going to give me my orangey, rich orange and reddish tones. And one of the fun things about quinacridone magenta or primary magenta is if you add just a hint of yellow, you can basically mix a red. So you don't need an extra red on your palette. I think I mentioned that earlier. You can go much more minimal with your palette. I'm going to move this over and let you guys see the mixing a little bit more. I know it's a little glary, but <laughs> I think it's fun to see that. Um, any purple on my, on this sheet is going to be obviously the pink and the purple or pink and the turquoise, which by the way, Turquoise mixes some of my favorite purples because they're usually more muted. Gray. We get a lot of grays and browns. But what I, one of my favorite things about this way of working is it's fun, first of all. It's not tedious tying up all like um, measuring out your squares and doing all of that obsessive stuff. Like I just love this. It's all about discovery and just seeing what happens. And you usually learn a lot. <laughs> I, I do. And then sometimes I'll think, okay, now I want to make brown. So mixing my green with some of my red tone will start really leaning me down into grays and browns. And while doing this, you discover new mixes all the time. I, I do anyway, like you really start to learn your colors. This is how I learn what colors make brown, what colors make gray, what colors make deep blue and, and all these amazing muted colors that I end up loving. I never would know without trying this. And the more you do it, the more you memorize it. So that's one reason I like using the same limited palette all the time for like months at a time, because then, then you really, really learn it and it, it like sticks in your head. Like 
if you use the same colors all the time, you remember what it's going to happen when you mix certain colors, which is very, very useful when you're outside painting and you, you're working quickly. Like, I think that's why I do so many mixing charts all the time. Just let's get some more blue. It's also interesting to see how far you can push a color within a palette. Like what, how many variations of one blue can I do? Sometimes it's not so versatile. Like cobalt turquoise is not as versatile as a phthalo blue or maybe even ultramarine. See, I just mixed almost the same grays every time there, which isn't very useful. <laughs> Beautiful terracotta colors coming out. But after a few rows of this, you, you basically get a, a sense of what colors you can make from that limited selection. And this is the kind of thing that's going to happen on your painting anyway. So while you're painting, you're going to be mixing a ton and all your grays and browns and everything is bleeding and flowing. And that's the overall look that's going to be in your painting rather than like straight up swatches or like perfectly 50, 50 mixes of each one, which like I said, oops, this style of mixing chart is useful to an extent. But first of all, it's a dang headache to make. <laughs> and I just don't have that patience anymore. Um, it's gorgeous to look at, but I don't find it nearly as useful as doing what I'm doing now. Sometimes it's fun to not quite mix them so you get a little bit of streakiness because that will also happen in the painting a lot. This also teaches me how much how subtle each you you like touch the corner of your brush in a color just the very corner that's so little paint but it shows you how much that tiny amount of paint makes a difference in your mix um like if you really want to understand the power of pigmentation in your gouache <laughs> try this where you're like trying to make really subtle shifts from each swatch to the next it is harder than you think I usually end up jumping like a lot in between each color. Um, let's see what else. I didn't use a lot of yellow, so let's use yellow and get some white. It's slightly, it's got a little purple in there still, so let's add a little more. It's beautiful. Love those subtle yellows. Um, so we have brights, yellows, muted yellows, lots of green, lots of purple. Maybe we'll go a little more, let's do some more browns or like red, orangey browns, white. I know is going to just desaturate it a lot, which is another way I like to paint. Um, you were wondering how you mix thoroughly so you don't get streaks. <laughs> Sometimes streaks are great. Actually, one of uh, what, Mike Hernandez, an amazing artist, does gorgeous paintings and a lot of gouache paintings, a lot of plein air. 
he purposefully leaves streaks visible in a lot of his brush strokes because he loves that visual sort of vibration that happens among colors. So he like strategically lets his brush kind of dry out so it separates a little and loads it up with thick paint. Doesn't quite mix it all the way and puts the brush stroke down. I'm not doing that obviously, but he, you, if you look at his work, you can really see what I mean. It's fascinating. And he does it so intuitively and quickly. It's pretty amazing actually to watch. I think th I love that on rocks. I try to do it on rocks, sometimes in water because it, it has a very natural look, especially when the water's moving. I, I said I hate mixing colors, but now I'm feeling inspired. <laughs> yes, I highly recommend this. If you don't like mixing colors or find it tedious or whatever, like this is a really fun way to do it and you learn so much. And I know some of you are like, oh my God, I can't believe you're not writing notes about what colors you're doing, but maybe if you know if you do this feel free to write notes do it your way <laughs> the whole point of this is to make it useful to you because we all learn differently everyone has a different way of learning and seeing things and for me this sticks in my head a lot more and when i look at this 10 months down the road it gives me a better sense of these colors than like a, ch a perfectly gridded out chart um, let's get some deep purple. How about cobalt plus the magenta plus black? Oh yeah, maybe a tiny bit of white so I can see it better. Yes, love it. All right, I think I'm pretty much gonna wrap this one up. Um, now I'm gonna add a couple of these colors in just at the bottom here. But actually, you know what? This mixing, no, we'll do it, we'll do it. I was gonna say it's kind of, it might be pointless because this is basically that. This is basically somewhere around there, but why not? Just a little bit at the bottom. It's, you never know. That's the thing. Like, I think I know what's going to happen, but I'll probably be surprised. It's too much for your brain. <laughs> Understandable. I mean, I, I know we all work differently. All right, first we're going to do We'll do a little lilac section here and a little pale green section there. So lilac and the yellow. That's hmm, maybe around there. Let's get a little white. I can't see this giving me anything new, but you know, we'll give it a chance. The cobalt plus the lilac is kind of nice. I mean, basically anything I mix with this lilac is going to be pretty muted because there's so much white in it. Um, but again, that just shows you like with just a few colors, you can really do so much. I just made the same color lilac. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, 
if anything. I think I would use lilac as a color to instantly make a muted palette. Like maybe when you're mixing things for the distance of your painting, um, elements in the distance, especially on the coast when you have all that fog or that haze, this could be really useful. Uh, let's do some of that green pale. Yeah, lots of pastel shades. The, f I mean, try this on for a challenge. Make a painting, but with every single mix you make, you have to include a certain color. So if it's lilac, like that painting is going to be really stylized. And that is such a fun, challenging way of working. All right, we got our green pale. Of course, we got to try some white on. Let's get a little pink in the pale green and see what happens. It's a nice purple. It's kind of a muted purple. Let's go towards brown by adding some yellow. Maybe a little more green and pink. Interesting. So let's go more green and maybe a cobalt. Vintage look. <laughs> let's do pale green with black and pink. Ooh, interesting. Okay, I got a little surprise there. It's like a kind of a violet. Let's add more pink. Yeah, interesting. It is violet. It's still pretty muted. Okay, let's add yellow to get it towards brown. Ooh, interesting. That's kind of fun. It's uh, like more yellow than burnt umber, but still has that with that green undertone. It's kind of fun. I mean, yeah, okay. It surprised me a little bit. Okay. Very earthy. Those would be fun for um, like autumn fields in Scotland have a lot of those colors going on. Maybe a couple pops of brightness here and there, maybe throw in some of those sienna type tones, but that's very Highlands. <laughs> okay. So before we lilac, shadow and then up here we used perm yellow deep I would totally use this palette but I would probably also add a lemon yellow just for the times when I know I want a really bright pop of color here and there. I mean, there are brightnesses in there already. It's just that that's such a warm yellow. It does limit you a little, but maybe that's a good thing. Maybe this is a great option for someone who oversaturates everything. Um, it, I mean, it still can be super, super saturated. It's all about color relativity in a way, but if, you know, limiting yourself to the colors like this that are, the magenta is a really bright color. So you're still going to get that, that brightness, but it could be a fun option. White and black. Cool. Um, okay. Let's see. We'll do one more color sheet. 
I'm going to pick the colors this time. I'm going to use one of the reds. I'm going to use lemon yellow opera. <laughs> Hmm, do I want ultramarine or do I want a thalo blue? If I go with thalo, we're getting insanely vibrant here. Oh, you know what? Instead, let's go with cobalt. This is going to be a very stylized palette. Mainly, I'm curious to see... <sighs> no, I should probably use a blue. <laughs> Maybe we'll have this at... No, we're not going to use that. Okay. Thinking out loud. I could go crazy here and go with the most saturated colors in my thing. Um, it's going to be intense. <laughs> Need your sunglasses. All right, screw it. We're going with primary cyan. <laughs> But you know what? My challenge will be with this selection is making muted tones. Okay, so that's something I also love doing is picking like my bright CMYK type things and forcing myself down into a limited or, or a, a muted palette because it is a challenge and you have to mix a lot to do that. Uh, we'll go with white and burnt umber. If I can find it. <laughs> there we are. So the burnt umber is going to make it a lot easier to mute things down. Uh, this may be hideous. <laughs> to be honest, I'm a little skeptical. <laughs> because the opera does not get very dark, so I'll have to mix opera plus burnt umber plus a little bit of the blue to deepen it down for my darker reds and stuff. Might as well explore something new live on stream. What could possibly go wrong? It's all about discovery. The discovery paint challenge. And I probably need more white. Okay. First, we'll do a swatch of each one at the top so we remember what they look like at their most clean out of the tube. Oh god, my paint water is really dirty. Okay, so we have lemon yellow. Experimentation is fun. Opera. Oh my god. Primary cyan. Goodness. And burnt umber. All right, are you ready for this? The madness will ensue. Um, it's a little glary. Hold on, I'm trying to fix the lighting so it's not glaring as much, but I still need it to be bright. That's the thing. That's worse. I don't know if I can really make it not glaring but as it dries it becomes matte and you get to see everything uh, actually I could lift it up a little bit more with my towel maybe it's if it's at an angle it's a little easier to see it dries fast enough um, we'll put this over here and here okay we're going for it yellow lemon yellow in opera obviously 
orange. Oh, I diluted that quite a lot. Dang. Let's get some blue in there. Okay, let's do opera with blue. That's a purple. More blue. It's a little streaky. I'm not mixing super thoroughly. <laughs> blue, opera, plus a tiny hint of yellow. More yellow. I was thinking it might lean towards a turquoise, and maybe it is. Ooh, actually is. That's kind of fun. Let's set, um, give it a little opacity so we can see. That actually looks almost just like the shadow green pale. Weird. More opera. Maybe because it's such a unique color, it's not making brown. Like I really thought I'd be getting a lot of muddy colors for some reason. <laughs> My brain, well, there we go. We'll add a little more yellow. There we go. This is kind of fun. Like I really, sur it's surprising me. Let's, okay, let's add a bit of burnt umber to everything and really get it muted. Let's try straight up opera with burnt umber. It's kind of diluted though. I keep getting my brush too wet. Okay, more pigment, less water. Maybe a bit of white. It's actually a really pretty color. I bet if I lighten it with more, it's going to be a nice rosy tone. Uh, yeah, it is bright. That is insanely bright. Oh man. Okay. Primary cyan with burnt umber, which is an interesting green actually. Let's add a tiny bit of white to see. It's I guess because the primary cyan is so phthalo that it it just automatically shifts it towards a green. But it's so dark that you can almost not see it. It's a little bit more noticeable in person than on the screen. add some of the rose. Okay, I am really surprised at how well this is working. <laughs> I honestly don't know why I was like, oh, it's gonna be muddy. It's gonna be gross. I'm not gonna be able to mix a variety these preconceived ideas of, I am just so unfamiliar with that rose and kind of the primary cyan too. I'm not a huge, I don't use that often that I just didn't, I just didn't know. Let's get some greens going. I mean, we know we're gonna get intense green with lemon yellow and cyan. Those are very vibrant. Yeah, I mean, easy to get greens. And then with a bit of the opera, we can start muting it down. Burnt umber, get us some nice earthy greens. Almost like the moss green, the tube of moss green.
Okay. I mean, wow, bam, in your face. And then, like, from here down, I never would have thought those colors would be that. Especially the rose. That looks like colors I use, like crimson or carmine or something. So, that's good to know. I mean... I think if I was using rose though, I would only really use it in its vibrancy just to get those visual vibrations, those pops of color. I wouldn't really use it to mute it down because then it's just there fading in the background. Like, I don't know. It just seems kind of pointless to mute it down, but I don't know. It's just like a fun option to have, I guess. Yeah, lots of beautiful earth tones. Hey, Suzanne. Yep, just four colors. Well, plus white, obviously. I mean, I always, I always assume people are gonna be adding white to the palette because it's like necessary with gouache. White is the most used color, I would say. Uh, but yeah. Very pleasantly surprised with that one. Shocking. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna lay, I'm gonna cut this and show you guys how I make my test strips. Like if I was just doing this in my sketchbook, I would be more than happy to use rose. Since I rarely sell originals right now, I just, I don't, it doesn't, the light fastness doesn't matter. Um, okay, so when I do my test strips, what I do is mix, I always mix a color with white because that's usually when you see evidence of fading in a pigment is when you dilute it with either water or with white. So if to get the true light, it, you're, you're rarely using a solid color in a painting by itself. Usually it's mixed with something. A lot of times it's mixed with white. So most likely if it's going to fade, it's your swatch might not fade if it's a straight up like color out of the tube, but it might if it has white in it. So to get like a true light fast test, it's better to <clears throat> add a little bit of white. Gosh, I think I'm losing my voice. <laughs> Everyone sip water. Oops. Oh, oh, boo, boo, boo. So first things first, we'll do a pink swatch, of course. Um, so I'll show you how I do that. If you're really adamant about using a color and you just want to know the versatility of it like how light fast is it if it, it mix it with certain colors you can do a whole lot of light fast test strips for one color but I typically just mix each color with a bit of white um, so first straight up swatch across the whole thing at the top not too thick where it's like um globbed on there but not too thin so that it's a lot of the paper showing through like it's a fine line <laughs> you know you can you can sense it when it's there so I usually just go over it once or twice and then I start here I'll show you right here hold on I was running out of paper towels some may say money. I love the earthy tones. Yeah, the more I paint and the more sensitive I am to color in the landscape, I realize that gray is the the gray is the most important color in the painting. Without gray, everything is too saturated. But with a lot of gray and just hints of saturation here and there, it really makes it more of a powerful impact. You know what I mean? So I'm trying to get better and more sensitive to grays and browns. And 
how those play directly with the really saturated bits. Oh, Christiane, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for that. Uh, so next I get more white or more of the pure color. And then I touch just a hint of white. So I want it to be mostly the original color with just a hint of white. And then I do a strip of that. And once again, I'm trying not to like really glob it on there, but I also don't want too much of the paper. I don't want it to be diluted with water. So then I get reload the original color and then even more white this time. And I usually try to step it down so it's like very visually noticeable. Like that's noticeable next to the other color. And get that across the whole thing. And then same thing with way more white. I'll probably only do four versions. So like make sure it's definitely noticeable. Much lighter. And then my final one will be the whitest version. I cleaned my brush, was getting a little clogged up. <laughs> so now I'll mostly use white and really mix it in. Don't want streaks in your swatch sheets, your test sheets, uh, in your light fast tests, because you want to be able to see that color. Yeah, that's good. Um, and usually on one single sheet of paper like this, I'll get maybe two to three colors. I may only do three versions of it, like pure color, a little bit of white, and then a lot of white. And then I'll fit like three or four colors on this whole thing. Um, so next let's do, uh, let's do the cobalt violet because I'm really curious about that one. The world is mostly gray. Ooh, that's gooey. <laughs> this one's like squirting out of the tube, which is weird because I've once had a shin, a uh, Holbein tube of cobalt violet way back in the day, years ago. And it also was very, very gooey and like squirted out of the tube every time. So maybe it's just a thing with that pigment. Okay, so I have room for more and we'll do straight up color. Oh no, I kind of diluted that a bit. Make sure we don't dilute it too much. Um, and then just a hint of white. I probably need more white. And then more. And then my last one will be really white, really diluted with white. Could have probably gone even lighter than that, but that's good. Okay, and then I usually use my heat gun to speed up this process, but it's actually drying really fast. So I let this totally dry and then I cut it down the middle. So that one inside stays in my dark drawer and doesn't see the day, so it doesn't see the daylight. And the other side uh, or you could put it anywhere. It doesn't have to be a dark drawer. But anyway, one side is in, is the control strip. Where's my scissors? I had my scissors at some point. Um, they're missing. 
Oh, there they are. So one side stays in the drawer, stays inside, and the other side goes in the window. Oops. And, you know, as long as it's dry, I usually write at the bottom control and then the date, which is uh, 28, 10, 2023. And then I write window. Twenty eight ten twenty twenty three and then I write the names of the colors cobalt violet hue and opera So this goes in my drawer, the control goes in my drawer, and the test goes in the window. And I usually frame them in a piece, a big piece of glass all together. One, because my windows are, have condensation on them all winter, so I have to wipe them off every day. And then the I can just like take the framed samples out and quickly do that. Um, and it just protects them from moisture because it's very humid in Scotland. So. It's also just an easy way to transport all the test strips and not have to like tape them into the window, then untape them. And it's just, it's just so much easier. So they all get shoved into a big frame in the window <laughs> and I need more windows. My current, my bedroom window is almost totally covered with swatches and that's it. And then I do this for every single color I want to test, which is usually the whole line. And I check it maybe in a month and then I check it in two and then you know sometimes I forget for a few months <laughs> and ultimately though I will put the results in my gouache database which is on my fearless brush page you guys have heard me talking about that probably um this this is the the website that's my that's the site uh, that's the page with all my tutorials on it but there's also, if you go to like the menu, there's a gouache database and I have links to all of the light fast tests I've done and I'm still doing because they're kind of always in progress as well as tons of other information. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's what I'll be doing in the next few days, I guess, making those sheets, test sheets. So I'm going to wrap up the stream here. I think <laughs> it's been a long stream. I am really hungry and thirsty and my voice is a little sore. <laughs> so once again, if you want to buy the, or pre-order the gouache brush, sorry, the monthly gouache tutorial boxes, those will be available, available for pre-order until November 15th. I'll probably, you know, mention them a couple times in case anyone's on the fence and you want, don't want to forget the deadline, but you can go sign up. Um, for notifications on their site or just put it on your calendar. <laughs> so today we swatched all of the gouache that's going to be in the set in the gouache boxes over the course of the months. All of these colors and that was a lot of fun. Did some color mixing um, and at the very beginning I did show the oops oh god <laughs> these are all the brushes <laughs> that you get over the course of the months lots of different shapes L some new shapes that you haven't seen from me before but it's gonna be a lot of fun and of course like the majority of what you're paying for in the gouache boxes is my tutorial because it's a very in-depth full-length tutorial step-by-step -step. Um, and it'll be exclusive for those boxes, which is fun. So I'm really excited for that. And also thank you to everyone who's already signed up. It's, it means so much to me and I'm, it's just really fun to know 
that a lot of you have been commenting on my videos for so long and we're finally gonna kind of be like painting together and working together and I'm thinking I'm gonna make either some kind of special hashtag or a chat in my discord chat that we can all hang out in and like post updates from the class and share things I think that would be a lot of fun but yeah thank you all for hanging out with me today I hope you had fun hope you got some work done <laughs> I will be back soon with another video maybe another live stream at some point soon it's fun Aw, oh, thanks, Sephite, for the next coffee. Oh man, you know my addiction. <laughs> yeah, that'll help. Thank you. <laughs> all right, everyone, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I will see you all soon. Happy painting. Bye-bye. <laughs>